Okay, great. Well, it's eight o'clock. We'll just give people another maybe 30 seconds here. I see we still have some people uh, coming in and then we'll, we'll get started with uh, C squared councils and conversation. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for today's conversation, how to increase workforce diversity while avoiding legal pitfalls. Uh, my name is Garrett Sheehan. I'm president and CEO of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce and Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Thanks so much for joining us for C-Squared. This is our councils and conversation, and uh, we hope to be doing it in person in the very near future, but we'll uh, continue this way virtually for at least a little bit longer. Uh, today's presentation is brought to you by the Human Resources Council, which is presented by Carmody Torrance Sandak Hennessy, and our Diversity and Inclusion Council, presented by CH Insurance. Also, want to take a moment before we get started to thank all of our other sp sponsors, including the Avangrid family of companies, Connecticut Natural Gas, Southern Connecticut Gas, and UI, and also all of our investors here at the chamber as well. You see them scrolling on your screen, our premier key and principal investors. Uh, thanks to their support throughout the last year and continuing into this year, we're able to bring this important programming. So today's program is how to increase workforce diversity while avoiding legal pitfalls, as you saw from our HR Council and Diversity and Inclusion Council, something that many of us are thinking about. And we have a great panel with us here this morning. Um, as I introduce them, I'll just give a, a few notes to everyone if you can if you're not speaking, just put your uh, microphone on mute. We'll take questions in the chat or as people raise their hands. We'll turn to questions a little bit later on. And I should also mention that Tamika Miller is going to help it, be helping me uh, as we go through the questions. But um, before we do that, let me introduce our, our four panelists here. So we have Heather Latora, who's the president and CEO of Marrakesh. And Heather's also on the board of directors here at the chamber. Uh, Nick Zeno. Nick is a labor and employment partner and the chair of the business services practice group at Carmody. Also Amanda Nugent, litigation partner and co-leader and part of Carmody's diversity, equity and inclusion team. And Devon Alnati, program manager, workplace inclusion at Avangrid. So thank you four for joining us. And I think the best way for us to start this off and, and get into this topic, and, and Nick, maybe I'll start with you. Um, ju just give us uh, an overview and uh, some of the things that, that you're thinking about uh, in this topic and that we should all be thinking about. Sounds good, Garrett. And actually, I will, um, I'll will i just turn it over to Amanda because Amanda's sort of going to kick it off for us. But uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss this important topic with everyone. I think it's it's critically important that employers be thinking about this. And I uh, thank the Chamber very much for, for allowing us to uh, the opportunity to talk about it. So. Great. Thanks, Nick. And uh, we'll get to Amanda. I should have thrown yeah. Amanda. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, because I do have an agenda and just a few slides that we want to um, go through with everyone. So give me a moment just to um, go ahead and do that. And you should all... We can see it. Yep. Great. Great. So you should have in front of you right now um, a list of some of the topics that are going to be discussed today. Um, and we really designed this to be a conversation, but our goal is to touch on all of these topics and have some time for your questions at the end. So I'm going to actually start by turning it over again, um, this time to Devon and Heather to give us some background on what diversity, equity, and inclusion mean and why they are important in the workplace. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. So diversity, equity, inclusion, right? We've heard these words throughout 2020 and even more so now in 2021, right? So what, what is it? What is diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, when I think about diversity and inclusion, I think about this, right? So diversity is being asked to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance, right? And when you think about that kind of uh, that analogy, you think it to yourself, wow, right? When, if I can make sure that everyone is invited to the party, right, but also give enough of a chance for people to dance in the party, then I'm doing something good, 
But then you think, well, I've also heard of these words, equity and belonging. Well, well what, are, what are those, right? So a, as much as diversity, which is more numbers and inclusion is more about uh, everyone at the table having a chance to say something, belonging is creating a space of authenticity, right? Making sure that everyone, when they're there, can feel like I can give my 100% self um, because that's when you're going to start seeing that innovation. That's when you're going to start seeing those changes that are so important when, it talk, when you're talking about the workplace and what makes a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment. Wouldn't you agree, Heather? Absolutely, Devon. I love the way you put it. Um, actually, diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging is in our bones. We were created 50 years ago, Marrakesh was, by two Yale students who met people with developmental disabilities and other disabilities. And they were living in institutions at those times. They weren't their own guardian. They didn't have, they weren't wanted in their communities. They didn't belong in their communities. So they were the opposite of included. And these two young Yale students are like, nope, there's gotta be a better place, created Marrakesh and that's how we were born. So just, we, we live this um, inclusive, life and we have to make sure that that value it belongs to everybody at Marrakesh from the people we support and our employees and you know people are so much more productive and so much more happier I mean we all have to go to work no one hit the lotto yet so you, when you go to work you want to make sure that you someone's waiting for you you're included you're part of the conversation and if you feel excluded work becomes even that much harder yeah, and I couldn't agree more, right? So when you look back at, you know, why is diversity, equity, inclusion so important to the workplace is, well, let's talk bottom line, right? And diverse diverse um, uh, skill sets of people creates a, a, a atmosphere of innovation. And that's what drives really what the bottom line is for all of us, right? Where, where we want to be successful. And without, without creating that group thing, right, where everyone's kind of the same thought pattern, has the same, the same background, more diverse uh, C-suites or leaders or just everyday people uh, allow you to go through some of those, you know, important tasks or those more mundane questions about, well, what do we do next? Or how do we get better? Or, or, or how do we attract more uh, people that want to work here? Well, diversity, right, and inclusion, and then belonging, right, all those pieces all work together, because that's what, what everyone's looking for. I mean, think about our, our, our newest, you know, workforce, right, millennials, Generation Z, and how important diversity is at, at, at when they're applying for jobs, right? If they don't see uh, a diverse set of individuals who are authentically giving their uh, honest opinion about something, well, then they're not going to work there. Right, so that's why diversity is so key uh, when it comes to just everything, right? And I, I hate to Absolutely. put that blanket statement out there, but it's everything, right? Yeah. Um, and I can't speak to it enough. And, and those of you that are my age might remember when diversity was tolerance, workplace tolerance. Mm -hmm. And that is so not what it is at all. And so we make sure that when people are hired or they start or they're working that we remind them we actually embrace diversity we don't tolerate people's diversity we love it and and you know you notice neither of us said oh because it's the right thing to do it's the right thing to do for our bottom line it's the right thing to do for as humans it's the right thing to do at work so um but you don't even have to say that because it just should be right right and Mary Rose asked a very good question. The question, if, if you all can't see it, it says, how do organizations create a space for authenticity in tangible ways? And that's such a great question because tangibility is the, the, the hardest part when it comes to authenticity. But here's, here's what we do, right? At least at Open Grid, is we, we, we create a space where we have open and honest conversations. And that, that's a good place to start right, is when you're allowing yourself and your employees to have honest conversations, let's say about things that happened in 2020, well, you're creating a space for authenticity, 
right? Go on other day, go on other days. And I'm, I know that Nick and Amanda will kind of jump into this, but go on other days where we kind of check our personal baggage at the door. Well, now we're encouraging you to, to bring it in because we want all of you at work, right? We, we want to know what, what, how many kids you have and, you know, what they're doing at school and, you know, and, and, and how that impacts you as a person, because if you're able to say, well, hey, I can bring my all, all myself today and every day, then, then you're going to appreciate what I can and cannot do, right? I think that's an important piece, too, is I can do these things, but I'm also not able to do this because of maybe my family, my background, my religious, you know, uh, affiliations, whatever the case, right? And that's okay, because that's creating that space of authenticity because now you as an employer or you as an employee knows where those boundaries are. And that's important. And one last thing, um, the, you all could relate to maybe having a safety program at work, right? And whether you're in manufacturing or everyone's in an office, you want to maintain a safe work site. So it's not just a check on a list like, oh, we train everybody when they walk in and now everybody's safe and we don't have to worry about workers comp and people getting sick or people um, uh, getting hurt at work. So you have a whole initiative. And, um, and then you could say you have a culture of safety. So maybe you could relate to it that way. It's not just a one and done. And it is throughout um, from the time that you're actually writing a job description. There are things in job descriptions that might exclude people that you thought maybe years ago was a necessary in the job description. And um, I feel like our attorneys are going to be able to come on in and, and talk about that a little more and, and the do's and don'ts. And then uh, we'll continue the conversation. We will, Heather and uh, Devon. Um, I, before we even get to the specific details, just a, a question for some of the organizations who um, maybe unlike both of your organizations fully embrace the concept of DEI. Talk for a minute about the importance of, let's assume there's an, there's an HR manager on this call um, who, who wants to promote DEI, um, but DEI efforts at their organization, but the only way to really make that happen is if management buys in. And mm -hmm. it's something that the organization as a whole fully embraces. It can't be just an HR manager sort of on their own um, so what, how would you advise that, that HR manager who um, goes to the senior executives who say, what is all this DEI? What are you talking about? How do you convince management to um, appreciate the importance of DEI efforts? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the first stab at this. So what, what I would say to any senior leader, whether you're a, a shop of 10 or a shop of you know 10,000 employees is, what we started the conversation with, and that's the bottom line, right? It is proven, right? You can look at Forbes, Harvard, um, you know, Wall Street Journal, whatever the case, it's proven that more diverse um, candidate slates or more diverse senior leaders or more diverse teams are proven to be a, 10 times more successful than homogeneous teams, right? So if you want to uh, increase your bottom line. If you want to attract the newest and the brightest talent, then DNI has to be an imperative because without it, you're going to miss out on. You know, I mean, we're in, we're in New Haven County, right? The, the Yale grad who who loves diversity, equity, and inclusion, but doesn't see that at, at, at the board level or at the senior level, that you're going to miss that person. Um, and that that's the piece that D&I is, is, is so important to capture because without those in-betweens, without those, I apologize, without, without, without those, uh, those nuggets, then you're, you're missing out on so much more than just, you know, oh, we're that D&I stuff. It, we'll get to it when we get to it. No, you're missing out on talent. You're missing out on creativity. You're missing out on innovation, right? All those things are so important. That is exactly what I was going to say about getting um, great applicants. And also, sometimes senior leaders are a little nervous about it because they don't feel like experts. I'm not an expert. I'm the president and CEO at our company. But I know I have a team of people that are going to help us through this journey and make sure that it always remains on top as an initiative. So, so telling the senior group that we're going to help. We're creating, here's some ideas. Uh, uh, we have a 
multicultural advisory council with people at all different levels at the organization that actually help us make sure that we hit our mark with um, continuing on with our uh, journey. So let them know they're not alone and right. that um, you know we'll make mistakes along the way, but committing to it is huge for all of your employees and your customers. I was just buying something from uh, Bed Bath & Beyond and I saw at the end, of, after, I, after I bought everything, it said we, um, most of our suppliers are diverse, are minority owned companies. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. I'm going to use them again. Like your customers are happy to see that as well. Great. Thank you. Um, with those background principles in mind, um, Nick and I are going to just briefly cover some legal issues to consider um, while uh, looking to increase diversity in your workplace. And, and Nick is going to start that conversation for us. Great, thank you, Amanda. So uh, first and foremost, I just wanna make clear up front that there are legally compliant ways to promote DEI in your workforce. So anyone who's thinking, boy, I'm concerned about legal, um, legal risk, if I promote DEI or I begin thinking about protected characteristics in order to promote DEI, um, there are legally compliant ways to do that. And uh, before we get in, into those, I just wanna remind everyone about some basic, very well-established uh, legal guidelines that we also can't ignore. Um, our goal here is to sort of give you a basic framework for you to promote DEI in a legally compliant way, but ultimately the steps that you take, the specific steps that you take, the specific programs, the initiatives that you take um, really should be reviewed with legal counsel. We can't get into all the, all the specific details, but starting with the very basics that I'm sure all of you know, and it's just as a, as a reminder, um, there are federal and, and Connecticut anti-discrimination statutes that prohibit discrimination based on a, a number of protected classes. And we have on the screen really just a partial list. You can add to that a number of other classifications like pregnancy and religion and citizenship, veteran status, um, and so on. And these statutes, these federal and state statutes prohibit discrimination on two basic theories. One is known as disparate treatment and that is where an employer makes a specific employment decision affecting an individual based on a protected classification. So for example, it's illegal under federal and state law to terminate an employee because of their age, right? And that that's, would be a disparate treatment. That particular individual was selected for termination because of a protected classification. Our federal and state laws also prohibit discrimination based on what's known as disparate impact. And that's where the employer did not intentionally discriminate against a particular group or a protected classification, but rather used a process um, that tends to either screen out if you're hiring or terminate employees that has a disparate impact on a particular group uh, based on a protected classification. So it's not intentional, but the process by which an employer makes a decision or a particular policy that an employer has, has a disparate impact on one particular group over other groups. And so um, those federal and state laws continue to apply um, and, and they would make it illegal to give you a, hopefully an, an easy example. It would be illegal for an employer um, to tell a recruiter, for example, you know, I want you to, um, um, I want you to hire somebody um, who, is, uh, who is a female or of a particular race. And if the, employer, if the recruiter carries out that directive um, it would be both illegal and discrimination for the recruiter and for the employer to uh, make a decision that is just blatantly based on a protected classification, even if it's for the laudable and noble goal of promoting, of promoting DEI. Um, it would also be illegal for an employer during the recruiting or hiring process to ask employees about these protected characteristics. For example, it would be illegal to ask an applicant, you know, what is your age? Uh, and employers certainly shouldn't be asking applicants, what is your race, what's your national origin, where were you born, um, and so on. Those sort of employment decisions based on a protected classification, you know, are, are and continue to be illegal. Um, and, you know, your DEI program that you ultimately adopt, should you choose to promote DEI in your workforce, you know, still needs to be cognizant of those very basic um, prohibitions. Um, but, 
you know, as I mentioned, um, there are things that an employer can do to promote DEI without violating the law. And, um, you know, some of you, I'm sure, are federal contractors or subcontractors, and you're required to have a formal written affirmative action plan that you need to review and update each year. Generally speaking, you know, the affirmative action requirements apply to employers, um, federal contractors, and and some subcontractors who have federal contracts of, of $50,000 or more and have 50 or more employees. And so you should know if you are a federal contractor or subcontractor and you're required to have an affirmative action plan. Um, those affirmative action plans, in a nutshell, they're, they're far more complicated than what I'm going to describe, but, but they basically require employers to evaluate the composition of their workforce um, by protected classifications such as race, ethnicity, gender, disability, veteran status, and compare that composition of the workforce to the relevant labor market where that employer principally hires its employees. And, and there's data that uh, employers um, look at that is published by the Connecticut Department of Labor, the Federal um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, where you can get that information about the relevant labor market. And employers are supposed to review the composition of their workforce in various job categories, compare it to the um, labor market and determine whether or not there's an underrepresentation of particular groups. And if there is an underrepresentation, um, the employer in their affirmative action plan is required to identify that underrepresentation and efforts that the employer will make to address that underrepresentation, whether it's in their recruitment process, expanding the, um, the job pool of applicants to promote um, more opportunities to address that underrepresentation, or if there's an underrepresentation within certain job categories in a group. So for example, if you're a, a larger company and the senior, uh, the senior management um, has an underrepresentation, let's say of women, for example, maybe there's internal job programs um, or educational programs that the employer uh, might adopt to increase promotional opportunities for, for females so that you address that underrepresentation. So the employer is supposed to do that sort of analysis is required if you're a federal contractor or subcontractor, you're required to do that analysis every year. Um, and you're required to continue to make changes to those to that program every year to address that underrepresentation. So it begs the question, you know, what if a private employer who is not a federal contractor, who is not a subcontractor, who's not required to have an affirmative action plan, what if a private employer simply wants to do it on a voluntary basis? And um, this issue actually came before the United States Supreme Court a long time ago in 1979. And the United States Supreme Court held that Title VII does not prohibit a private employer from voluntarily enacting um, a legally valid affirmative action plan if certain factors are met. And um, the Supreme Court basically said that you can hire with protected class as a factor, and that's important, as a factor. Remember the rule, we can't, you can't make employment decisions specifically because of a protected job classification with very, very limited exceptions. You know, the, the one exception is where it's a bona fide occupational qualification, but that's, that's a very limited exception. So hiring with protected class as a factor is okay where it's justified by manifest imbalances in traditionally segregated job categories. It's narrowly tailored to achieve the goal of remedying past underrepresentation and it's temporary in nature. So those are the factors that need to be met before an employer can start using a protected job classification as a factor. The U.S. Supreme Court also said that affirmative action programs that are implemented simply to maintain racial balance in the workforce or to support diversity in the workforce, again, while noble and laudable, is not permissible under the law. So it has to be done with the goal of addressing these, of addressing a manifest imbalance in the workplace. And so um, for an employer, that can be a little bit tricky because you have to, as an employer, first identify a manifest imbalance. Um, and that alone for some employers can create, can create legal risk. It's not necessarily a reason not to do it, um, but you would need to do it carefully. And, and you know, often it's done if an employer chooses to adopt the voluntary affirmative action plan um, under the advice of an attorney with an attorney client privilege so that the analysis itself can be protected. But 
you know, you do, if you do decide to move forward with an affirmative action plan, a voluntary affirmative action plan or other DEI efforts, you have to be careful about, you know, setting goals or setting quotas versus setting goals. And I'll turn it back to Amanda, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, quotas versus goals. Thanks, Nick. So um, Nick and I both advise clients who are working on DEI initiatives. And one thing that we commonly hear is um, the, the, um, the desire to set a quota of how many people um, of diverse backgrounds or of a particular background or characteristic um, the company wants to bring on in a time period. And, um, and that raises some legal concerns. And that actually goes all the way back to a Supreme Court case that uh, was decided in 1987. Um, and there, the, um, the transportation agency of Santa Clarita, California adopted a voluntary affirmative action plan that encouraged the promotion of female employees. And they did that because they had no female employees in lots of job roles. And a male employee was passed over for a promotion as a road dispatcher um, in favor of a female candidate and challenged that result in court as being discriminatory. Um, and the Supreme Court held that the employer hadn't done anything wrong in this case um, and, and had in fact implemented a legal uh, voluntary affirmative action plan of the kind Nick was just talking about. Um, and part of the reason that the court was able to reach that goal or reach that, that uh, result was because it found that the employer hadn't set aside a certain number of jobs for female employees, hadn't put a quota in place, but instead set a flexible yearly goal about how much they wanted to inc increase um, diversity across gender um, that, they, that they constantly reviewed um, and that didn't create what the court saw as an absolute bar to male employee advancement. So the key takeaway here really is that when diversity metrics are framed as quotas, they can be problematic because they can prohibit certain, or they can be viewed as prohibiting certain applicants from getting um, a particular position, where when it's framed as a goal, it does not. So what does this look like in application? An example of a quota is we will hire five women into management positions in 2021. Um, and an example of a goal that might meet the same um, requirement is that we will increase the percentage of women in management by 30% over three years. So you've probably heard a lot of these types of um, goals in, uh, um, in the media. Um, some good examples are the 25 by 25 initiative, which is the tech industry's goal to increase leadership diversity by 25% uh, by the year 2025. And the Mansfield rule, which we use in the legal field, um, to which uh, requires um, employers to consider 30% underrepresented persons for each open leadership position. And framing, um, framing diversity metrics in terms of goals or diversity uh, initiatives in terms of goals really has several benefits. So it creates accountability without setting you up for failure. And what does that mean? It, it means that there is a stated objective which can be measured and which um, managers and people who are in hiring positions can use and can be measured against, but it does not have the hard and fast quality of a rule, which, you know, for some, and in some circumstances, goals uh, just may not be able to be met for any number of real world reasons outside of an organization's control. So if you set it up as a goal rather than as a, as a rule, as a quota, um, that gives you the flexibility you need to deal with, um, with any um, unforeseen circumstances while still creating accountability. Um, it also avoids the appearance or the possibility of tokenism. So sometimes when there are quotas in place, there can be a perception um, or a feeling that someone was hired just to fill that, that quota, irrespective of what their other qualifications are. So they could be the most qualified person by and far ahead of all other applicants, but because there is that perception that, that you know, there's this 
diversity rule that we need to meet. So they got it because of that. That destroys the work, the feelings of inclusion and belonging for that employee and erodes the culture in your organization for all employees. Um, so taking away that by framing it as a goal can really have um, lots of benefits in that way. And it also just creates less risk of a legal challenge, which uh, is something that Nick and I um, like because lawyers tend to be really risk adverse and that, that, have, that is another um, nice benefit of framing um, diversity initiatives in terms of goals. So with that background, we are going to um, talk a little bit about what do you do? So we told you what you can't do. We told you what the law says. How do you do this work? How do you increase diversity within this framework? And I've, I've put up on the screen a, a list of some ways that we've brainstormed. We're not gonna read this. We're just gonna open it up and have a conversation now um, about the, some of the things that we can do um, and hopefully have some time for your questions as well. So anyone who wants to jump in and start uh, with some of the ways that they, uh, the best practices that they like to use, um, we'll, we can start, we'll start there. So Amanda, um, we see naturally, I had to have faith in it, but naturally now we get so many candidates of, from all diverse areas because of who we are. And it just happens and um, whether, so like we were talking about, there's so many different touch points. So even in our main office, when you come in, you might see the rainbow flag, you'll see a Black Lives Matter um, poster. People are not gonna come in and apply for that job if that is something that makes them uncomfortable. People are going to beg for this job if that's what, that makes someone very excited about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and Devon, he has, like 17,000 employees. So I know he has a lot of tricks up his sleeve in that area. So um, in different ways to attract and then retain uh, a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our things is making sure even from the beginning and when, we're t when we have employee testimonials on our website, we make sure that we, we show all of our different employees that have worked with us for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 years, and um, they talk about their their own experience. So I, I think what you're talking about, it's so ingrained in Marrakesh's DNA, but it's really important, these subtle things that you're doing, the signage, the representation from just the, the moment, every outward facing touch point is, is reinforcing the, the message of um, we are an inclusive workplace. So those are, and those are things that, that anyone can do, right? They can make sure that they are, they're, they're, um, they're doing that in their physical space and in their um, online space. Absolutely. And we know then it's working because when we're hiring people, most of the people we're hired and, and we, I meet every single new hire through the door because I do like to talk about our values and diversity and inclusion is one of our three core values. And so we do tell people on their way in, but I also find out how come they, they applied to work at Marrakesh and more than half have always said word of mouth. Someone that works there told me about that job. So people aren't referring their friends and family and loved ones to come work for a place that was not, um, that doesn't hold that value if that's what they value. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to hear from Devon as to some of your, some of your, uh, the tricks that, uh, um, Heather alluded to, but or ideas, I shouldn't say tricks, but, but I do think the, um, and maybe one of you can speak to just, there's a bullet there that says evaluate any internal referral programs. Um, what do we mean by that? I mean, I know what we mean, but, but if, if somebody can speak to that and the importance of increasing the pipeline um, for, for diverse applicants, like just what are some thoughts that you guys have um, and ideas that you've used or would suggest employers to use to, to address those particular issues? Sure, so one of the things that we're starting to do more of, um, and shout out to my uh, colleague, Norma Ortega, who is leading the charge in our internship and talent development pipe, our early development pipeline, that's huge for us right now. In fact, last year we had our most diverse internship program in company history, which is huge for us, right? Because it shows not only our commitment to 
our early development program, but also to diversity and inclusion. So if you're an employer who's looking to start somewhere, that's an awesome place to start because you have young, eager, and mostly diverse uh, candidates who are out there looking to start their careers and do something different. And what better way to showcase that both internally and externally by having a, a robust uh, internship program. Um, and then more than that too is showcasing or, or explaining what you're doing. A lot of great things are happening internally in a lot of our places of employment, but sometimes we don't do the best job saying, hey, here's what we're doing or here's our progress. And I think that is the easiest easiest way uh, to really increase and improve your diversity metrics because uh, kind of like what Heather was saying, right? The, the more you show off what you're doing, the more people see it and the more people are attracted to come to a workplace that, that looks like them, which is so huge. Um, but Nick, you mentioned the internal referral programs and I, and I think uh, this is, uh, uh, some employers like this avenue of, of uh, diversity. Uh, and some others don't. Um, at Auburn Grid, we're, we're always looking for our employees to share a good story with someone that they know who can bring and has the Auburn Grid values for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it's a great way, again, like a, a friend of a friend or another colleague from a different company you used to work for, just sharing those stories about, hey, you know, at Auburn Grid, we have business resource groups, our communities or affinity groups that we can be a part of, which helps us r really kind of dive into, you know, the things that we like and do. And, you know, that helps us create this awesome network of friends across the entire uh, company network, which is awesome, right? And, and, and that can create more of that pipeline, that development pipeline um, for, you know, early career candidates or mid career candidates or late career candidates. Uh, it, it's just, again, sharing the stories and being authentic about what, what's important to you and why your company is the new destination for someone else. One thing that can happen with internal um, referral programs though, and, and part of the reason that I, that I think that everyone should be intentional about using them is that if you don't have as diverse an organization as an Avon Grid or as a Marrakesh, um, and it may be if you're a smaller employer um, with, with few employees and you're at the beginning of your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey, sometimes um, those internal referral programs will lead you to, um, to continually see the same type of applicant from the sm same small spheres of influence. Um, and so sometimes um, based on the situation, those referral programs can actually have the opposite effect. They can actually um, make an organization less diverse because people aren't reaching outside of their network um, to include new voices, to include different folks um, into the group. Um, so, so, you know, you, you both use those programs really well um, and to, to great effect, but sometimes they can have um, the opposite effect of what you're talking about. And I also want, well, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Amanda. I also wanted to, to just mention the pipeline, um, pick up on the pipeline discussion. Um, and, and I think that is something that Carmody does really well also, but on a much smaller scale. Um, so we only have about 175 employees. And so our pipeline program is um, for three college, four college students a year and one law school student a year um, who are diversity, equity, and inclusion scholars with us. Um, and that pipeline program certainly isn't as big as something as you do at Avangrid, um, but it is, but it's possible to do it at any size organization. And it's a wonderful way to, um, to meet new people and to give opportunities um, to people who um, are traditionally underrepresented in, in any sphere. So, so pipeline and uh, internship programs are possible, I think at any level and a really great way to increase um, diversity, equity and inclusion. Yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right, Amanda and Devon. I mean, I, I would just point to the NFL and the Rooney Rule that they have adopted some some years ago, actually, and it's something that employers can can and we know many companies have um, also utilized this approach. And under the NFL's Rooney Rule, 
Uh, it basically requires teams to interview two minority candidates from outside their organization for any head coaching positions and at least one minority candidate from outside their organization for other types of positions um, in the coaching staff. And so employers have taken that model um, and required, you know, for any open positions and certainly open senior leadership positions that, you know, diverse candidates, a certain number of diverse candidates or percentage of diverse candidates at least be given the opportunity and be interviewed and considered before that position is filled. And so that's not illegal. Um, that is with the goal of increasing opportunities, ensuring that you aren't simply referring or simply hiring based on internal referrals, um, but, but rather, um, ensuring that all individuals from different backgrounds have an opportunity to um, be hired in those sort, sort of positions. I, I see we have a, a question um, about uh, if you're letting people hang up uh, visuals or signage about um, diverse perspectives, wouldn't you as an employer also have to allow those that might be on the other side of the spectrum? And that that did worry me at first, when, um, but we have specific policies about who hangs up what. And so our Multicultural Advisory Council is in charge of the, the place where we're allowed to hang things up. And so it all goes through the council and, and they could submit what they want. Um, and that's where things are, are hung up or displayed. I don't know, but maybe the lawyers have a better idea or other thoughts about that, because it is scary. People might want to hang up their SWAT sticker or something, and then what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it just depends on on what you know what individuals um, are looking to say. And I think that was the you know Amanda that was the the Starbucks versus Amazon um, case that we had we had talked about and written about. I don't know if you want to just comment briefly on what what that, you know, what that issue was about with Starbucks and Amazon. Sure, yeah, we have, we just have a few minutes left, but I'm happy to, to just say a few words about this. So this, um, Starbucks and Whole Foods, which is owned by Amazon, yeah. um, it, that's took two totally different approaches to um, what happened last year when um, their employees came into work wearing masks that said Black Lives Matter. And um, Starbucks, uh, you know, in both of the incidents, um, it was technically against dress code to have non-company related messaging on any of your attire and that included masks. So Starbucks took the position that, um, that the masks uh, were against dress code, but we're going to fix that by having a standard um, Black Lives Matter dress code option that you can choose. Then they put it on a t-shirt that they distributed and anyone who wanted to wear that could. So it was in keeping with their branding, their marketing, but it, it expressed the political message that some employees wanted to express. Whole Foods took the absolute opposite approach and said, nope, this is against our dress code and we are going to um, tell you to go home. We're, you're gonna have to go home and change. And they got sued because of that. Um, and the issue was that whole, you know, whole Foods, um, the employees claimed, and it's still being litigated in Massachusetts in the federal courts and, and is about to go up on appeal to the first circuit that, um, the, that um, the claim was that uh, Whole Foods was in, was asking people wearing Black Lives Matter masks to go home, but they weren't asking people to go home who were wearing non-company branding relating to other issues like LGBTQ plus pride or um, NRA, or even people wearing um, branding relating to sports teams. So they felt that they were getting treated um, differently, that there was a disparate impact on the way the dress code was being enforced as Nick was talking about earlier. And that um, that landed them in, in a very long ongoing legal trouble about um, their dress code being unevenly enforced based on the viewpoint that was being dis dis uh, expressed. So it, it gets into a really tricky area um, when you're talking about this. Um, we've got a couple more questions here and I apologize, only one minute left. Um, we had a question about what can small businesses do um, who may not always be hiring, but who um, want to work on their diversity, equity and inclusion um, without hiring new folks in, but what can you do to expand or to increase within your own organization? Does anyone have thoughts they wanna share about that? Sure, so I, I would say uh, start with education. 
right? I think that's the easiest way to go about uh, increasing a, a, a diverse slate of thought and mindset. Um, and it can also open the doors uh, for your hiring managers when you, you are ready to hire. Now that they have that foundation education, they'll be more mindful of who they're looking at for their next uh, candidate and how that's going to impact the longevity of the organization. So I would say ed education is a good place to start. Uh, and again, social media is probably the easiest and most cost effective way to also show your support for DEI as well. Well, um, we're, we're not done yet. Uh, we, we're going to do our breakout rooms now, but I just want to uh, first thank Nick and Amanda, Heather, and Devon. Uh, it was a great presentation, and we can continue the conversation now. Um, what you, If you've attended our C-squared in the past, uh, what we do for this, just to kind of reenact what we would do in person, uh, we do networking rooms, breakout rooms for the last 15 minutes. So uh, Tamika is going to set those in place, and what we'll try to do uh, we may have to move you guys around a couple of times, Amanda and Nick and Devon and Heather, but we'll try to make sure one of you is in each of the uh, breakout rooms so we can continue the discussion further. And feel free to talk about anything else. This is also an opportunity just for general networking. So um, we'll leave from the breakout room so we won't come back. We'll close at nine o'clock. And uh, I just again want to thank uh, Carmody, want to thank CH Insurance for being our presenting sponsors of our councils and both of our councils, diversity and inclusion and HR for putting on this programming. And it was great seeing all of you today. I will let you know that on May 4th, we're doing a procurement event uh, for small businesses with a particular focus on our BIPOC businesses. We're gonna have some of our anchor institutions speaking about how you get into their pipelines so the hospital, the university, um, and also the state of Connecticut. And then we're gonna do a second session. So it's gonna be a two panel session uh, where we talk about how you get your business ready to be able to serve those anchor institutions. All right, well, we will uh, move over into uh, the breakout rooms. Tamika is gonna set those in place and uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks. How many, uh, Tamika, did you do three or did you do two? I did three because a lot of people were jumping off. Yeah. Yeah, we started leaving people. As you were, people, as as you were talking, talking, people, yeah, as you were talking, people were leaving. So <laughs> I got a, I, not, I got Nick in the room, I got Devon in the room, and I got Amanda in the room. Uh, Nick will be with um, Heather, but that's okay. At least we have in each room. Yeah, and it seems pretty. Yeah, it seems okay. Well, it worked okay. out good. They were they were great. So uh, yeah, that they covered their it, own but... show. So you were the one who was telling them basically about uh, <laughs> the fact that we have these uh, breakout sessions. Yeah, it, uh, I don't know what Glenn and uh, Glenn and Jesse are both like. Uh, they were like, uh, you know, my favorite term, like bystanders for this. You know, like oh, I don't oh know. My God. Yeah. So. It's crazy. <laughs> oh my God. Who would just email me this morning? I, I can't believe you sent me this email. What did he say? This was in response to my, you know, what's going on. Oh, he said, I really don't know. I saw that. You do a great job. You, I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions. <laughs>